come to the end of Tom Baker's 12th series of Big Finish Adventures in the audio medium. The concluding chapter of series 12 is Angels and Demons. So, for those of you who aren't quite caught up, in series 11, the Doctor and Leela met a artist called Margaret in the Ravencliff Witch story, and she was a pretty fun character. So the next season, they thought, let's bring her in as a full-time companion. This is Neris Hughes icon of stage and screen and also of the fifth doctor era as well was it kinder or was it snake dance either way she was in either kinder or snake dance i always get those two mixed up but she has become a full-time companion for series 12 series 12 part one new frontiers i reviewed it a few months back pretty solid start good ice warrior story good bank high story i enjoyed it quite a bit and now we've got part two angels and demons which has four count them four stories. We've got The Wizard of Time by Roy Gill, The Friendly Invasion by Chris Chapman, Stone Cold by Roland Moore, and The Ghost of Margaret by Tim Foley. As Big Finish tend to do with the Fourth Doctor adventures, you can either get the full box set or you can get uh, two of them, but they leave out The Ghost of Margaret, which is weird because The Ghost of Margaret is an unambiguous finale to the series. So you can you can get the Wizard of Time and Friendly Invasion, two two parters here as one set, or you can get Stone Cold as its own. But if you want the Ghost of Margaret, if you want the finale, uh, you have to get the Fourth Doctor Adventures Series Twelve Angels. It will be like imagine getting a DVD of Series One of Doctor Who, but you can't get Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways unless you get the whole series itself. But you can get the individual story like. This is weird. I don't know why they've done this. I don't know why the Ghost of Margaret isn't in... It's weird. I don't know why they've done it. Anyway, four stories. It's a pretty big set, starting with The Wizard of Time, which is a really interesting opener where you've got the Doctor, Leela, and Margaret, who are crossing paths with Jacob Harmer over the course of his life. Now, Jacob is an author, an acclaimed fantasy writer, who wrote children's books, has been acclaimed for a generation, and he's being visited by a psychiatrist, played by Mary Seacole in Doctor Who Flux. We've got Moira Tanaka, played by Sarah Powell, who has come to visit Jacob to make sure that he's not losing his memory. But as he retails the story to his psychiatrist, to his therapist, some of the details aren't quite lining up with reality. Some of the details are clearly way too fantastical to have ever have happened in real life. But it's really interesting because some of the story is narrated by Jacob Harmer, who is voiced by the late Ronald Pickup. Once again, he was also in Doctor Who. His very first role in TV was in The Reign of Terror, where he plays the pharmacist who rats out Susan and Barbara. Fun connection. Ronald Pickup actually passed away a couple of years ago. That's how long ago these box sets were recorded, so rest in peace to Jacob Harmer. But he plays Ronald, does a terrific job, and in order to avoid these weird wolf-like creatures that are chasing the TARDIS as an energy source, the Doctor decides to do the unthinkable and shrink it down and hide it in his pocket. Let's play a clip from The Wizard of Time. Doctor, you have shrunk the TARDIS. Emergency dimensional contraction. I had no choice, not with the Raposa running so close. But how do we get in? Can you shrink us? Not yet. <sighs> Dimensional contraction? You mean you wanted it to get smaller? By folding the internal architecture in on itself, its space-time footprint is changed. The Raposa will have lost the scent. That's the theory, anyway. They can smell the TARDIS. Well, they know what they want. We must have drifted across one of their dimensional pathways. Is it meant to be steaming like that? Well, the poor old thing had to draw in energy rapidly to execute the emergency program. We may have caused a cold snap. Possibly killed somebody's prized begonias. And so it was winter in the woods, I observed, because the magic box had changed size. Uh, a very cogent summary, young man. Would you like to stay on as my scientific advisor? I don't understand how this helps. Small things are more difficult to locate. We must hope that the wild hunt of the Raposa passes right over the TARDIS. Small things are also much easier to pick up and carry away. No, don't touch. Not while she's reconfiguring. Why not? Well, you could get a nasty shock. Imagine picking up a sugar cube that suddenly weighed as much as the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal? You only say these words because you know I do not understand what they mean. So basically, the format of 
the Wizard of Time. It's almost akin to like the return of Doctor Mysterio, where you've got the Doctor visiting this individual over the course of their life because they've got some strange connection. And also almost akin to like human nature and the family of blood as well. Uh it, it it's 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 got some really cool connections where like we're following uh no no not human nature. I just saw that in the chat. There was another it was um Oh, I've just, it's lost my, I've lost my brain. I love live streaming. I love going off the cuff. It's absolutely terrific. Now, but yeah, it's almost akin to like the return of Dr. Mysterio. And also like, oh, there's another story in the revived series. And I'm drawing a blank. I'm, I apologize, Roy Gill, for having an absolute brain fart when reviewing your story. Anyway, so yeah, it's, a, it's almost akin to like the return of Dr. Mysterio or also something a little bit like Blink where... You know, it, it's, it's, no, not, it was not human nature. It's not even blink. What, why is, what has happened to my mind brain? It's absolutely weird. Okay. So the Wizard of Time is structurally very similar to something like, <laughs> I can't even remember what the example was that I had. Oh dear. The Return of Doctor, it's not, no, it's not like Flatline. It was not like Flatline. It's almost, it's similar in structure to like the Return of Doctor Mysterio, where the Doctor sees an individual, in this case a young Jacob Harmer, and then they have a massive game-changing encounter. I don't know what series, I can't even remember the story. I can't tell you what series if I don't know the story, Dak, if I don't know. Uh, where's my mic? Um, so, yeah. Um, so, the, it's not Love and Monsters, but that's closer. That's a closer connection. Let me explain more and maybe you folks can help me. Um, also, yeah, Dalek, Dalek Bombs, I don't recommend Dalek's Genesis of Terror. It's interesting, and if it's like two or three pounds on sale one day, I recommend it, but not right now, and not, not at full price. So, yeah, with the, with, let's try this again, okay? This, I'll, this will be completely edited out of the video segment of the review, but you folks will bear witness to my brain meltdown. So, The Wizard of Time by Roy Gill is structured very similarly to something... I know now. I know what I was thinking. Okay, it is structured very similarly to like the return of Doctor Mysterio, where you've got the Doctor who meets a young person at a very pivotal part of their life and then goes in and checks up on them at different intervals while trying to stop an alien threat. And the Rings of Akaten, when the Doctor is like waiting for Clara to, to grow up and finding out if she's the impossible girl or basically how all this has happened. That's Jacob Harmer. Essentially, he's a very special individual who has an early... Uh, encounter in his life with uh, some weird alien wolves that are trying to take away the TARDIS so the doctor shrinks it and then over the course of Jacob's life has these weird encounters with Margaret <clears throat> with Leela with the doctor which influence the course of his life almost like a Christmas carol as well very Stephen Moffatty but what sets apart the Wizard of Time is the way that it formats itself and structures itself, where you've got Jacob, narrated brilliantly by Ronald Pickup, voice acted brilliantly, with really great authority, a brilliant voice as well, rest in peace, where he's filling in for his younger self and he's explaining what's going on to his psychiatrist, who has absolutely no idea what's happening. It's really fun, and I also got the sense that Tom Baker was really, really enjoying the premise, really enjoying being this titular Wizard of Time, which Jacob calls him, and <laughs> there's a really great encounter with like a, a Jacob who's like in his like late 20s early 30s and he encounters what he thinks to be a homeless man in an alley and he just turns out to be the fourth doctor just messing with his mind and being like oh I'll help you if you if you lace my hand with silver and he's got a TARDIS in his pocket it's re really really cool scenes really really great moments the threat itself these weird wolf-like creatures that are trying to take down the TARDIS aren't particularly that well defined but it is more to do with the structure and it is more to do with Jacob himself it's his story we see it a lot from his perspective and because it's only two parts as well the format doesn't overstay its welcome it's really pacey really punchy that's the advantage with a lot of these stories in these box sets wizard of time friendly invasion and the ghost of margaret they're all two parters so they move at a really fast and good clip and i think that really really benefits all of those stories involved and also the wizard of time has a really interesting ending like the actual role that Jacob is playing in his grown up, like older life, the role of the psychiatrist who's come to visit, e even the setting in which he's telling the story, really great late in the game twist that I really appreciated. And the way that the companions and the doctor react to it and respond to it, really cool. There's some really great doctorly solutions throughout the course of this, including the friendly invasion by Chris Chapman. 
So it's 1943, they're in Westbourne, this village, and you've got the American platoon of soldiers in World War II that were the inspiration for the TV show and the book, Band of Brothers. They have gathered together in this pub for drinks because tomorrow they're trained apart for the mission that would essentially define their role in history. And many of those men in that inn, in that pub, are not going to make it out alive. However, there's some weird malevolent force in Westbourne that is determined to mess with time for reasons that I will not explain because that's spoilers. The people of the village of Westbourne have not given the Americans a particularly pleasant welcome and that's exacerbated when one of them tries to break into the pub with fire instead of hands. After encountering that threat, they decide to take stock in the pub where Margaret has been the sole bartender but the landlord has gone missing, and the doctor decides it's time to step up. Here's a clip from The Friendly Invasion. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something vital to resolve before we can go any further. What's that? Ooh, a pub without a landlord is like a ship without a skipper, and we are in very real danger of being lost at sea. So? You want to be the landlord. Yes, I'd be an improvement. You don't think that we maybe have bigger things to worry about? Oh, you might have, but I've always wanted to run a pub. Is that all right with you, Margaret? Me? I mean, you're the only one who works here. It's your call. Fine. The doctor can be the new landlord. Now, can we talk about the old landlord? Stan's been mates with my dad since I was small. Everything about him out there was different. And I don't just mean the burning hands. I mean him. Really? Uh, we've not been introduced. I'm the doctor. Her name is Edie. He said that he'd chosen Joe, that he'd nominated him. Yes. What's so special about you, Joe? Nothing. I'm, I'm just a soldier. There's literally millions of us. You're part of Dainty Company. That's pretty special. Is it? Hey, it absolutely is. Just a soldier, eh? <laughs> Do you mind if I double-check that? Is, is that? Uh, it, it, it's a scanner. <clears throat> it, it, it scans things. Right. And just to showcase just how enthusiastic that Tom Baker was for this script and being a pub landlord, here's a little snippet from one of the interviews from The Friendly Invasion and just how happy Tom Baker was with this box set. Tom Baker here, playing the Doctor. In this story, I become a landlord of a pub. And from then on, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> He's, across all four of these stories, Tom Baker is so good. Like The material's terrific. Chris Chapman, who I don't believe has ever written for The Fourth Doctor before, it, like, is firing on all cylinders here as well. It's a really great script. It's also incredibly bittersweet because you've got this, of course, this really fun adventure that's taking place in World War II. I was a little bit hesitant going into this story because there was a World War I story in the last box set, set in the trenches, in, where, where the soil turns out to actually be the main antagonist of that story really really good so i was kind of worried oh there's also another world war story in this one but it's very very different it's a base under siege story set in this pub with the band of brothers characters and i think that um chris chapman absolutely hits out of the park here and i think he's he's also batting two for two isn't he chris chapman he did purification from purity unleashed a couple of months ago like he's he's on fire in terms of his scripts for this year great work for chris chapman what an absolute giga chad but anyway so the friendly invasion Really fun, intimate character piece as well. You've got um, Edie as well, who's this character who's climbed over the fence in order to see one of uh, the soldiers off the, the night before he goes away, uh, presumably to his fate, because these are real-life characters and not all of them are going to make it out of uh, the Second World War. And Margaret does not react very, very well to this. I, I love the companions over the course of this story, uh, this box set generally, but also this story, where you've got Leela, who's like very like war focused and you know, battle hardened and she doesn't see soldiers getting ready for war she sees boys who are 
un unaware and unprepared for the fates that are going to be befalling them. It's a really bittersweet performance uh, in, in that regard as well. And Margaret, who did lose somebody, we, we learn more about her over the course of this box set and this series in general, where she lost somebody during the war when she was much younger. And that was like the love of her life. And she's never really recovered from that. And it's one reason why she uh, feels so alone in her older years. Uh, some really, really great um, dialogue and drama from everybody contribute to this box set but Neris Hughes is brilliant over the course of the box set really really great stuff and because Margaret is quite new to time travel she doesn't quite know how to hold her tongue when it comes to the fates of some of the boys who are about to go to um, about to go to war on the train the next day I think that the A plot of the of the village or half of the villagers getting fire for hands and trying to uh, to change events that that takes a bit of a back seat, rightly so. But it, that bit's not particularly interesting. But it's a good instigator for all of this great character work. It's it's really well performed by the entire cast. Great performances, great writing. It's just a really good story. I think that if this was like just an individual release on its own, it would be worth picking up. But the fact that it's part of a consistently really, really strong box set is, of course, great news as well. But The Friendly Invasion, another two-parter, really, really easy. Now, the four-parter here, Stone Cold by Roland Moore, is the big, you know, weeping angel returning iconic villain of the box set. You had the Ice Warriors for part one and the Weeping Angels for part two for Stone Cold. So you've got the Doctor, Leela and Margaret arriving on this planet which was meant to be this lush beautiful forest planet but it turns out there was a big solar flare which turned it into a big molten volcanic barren landscape a hundred years ago. So the Doctor, Leela and Margaret have landed on the planet a little bit too late. And because of all the dust clouds and the obscured vision and the fog and everything, uh, it makes it very difficult to see, which makes it a very ideal environment for the Weeping Angels. It's a base under siege story where you've got this pleasure cruiser, which is crashed on the planet and is run by a group of reformed uh, conquerors, this race of people that used to conquer and colonize different like galaxies, but they've reformed and are now working almost entirely as a species in the service industry. So they want to try and atone for what they've done in the past, but they also want to explore and see the universe and facilitate that. It's a really cool thing. But it also means that because it's a pleasure cruiser, there's hardly any weapons on board and they are woefully unprepared for the Weeping Angels. Now, I did say on Twitter earlier that it's really great that Big Finish takes great care with the Weeping Angels in their classic stories because they've also had the Fifth Doctor encounter, encounter them. They've had the Eighth Doctor encounter them in both, uh, was it Doom Coalition? Uh, and also in Albie's Angels last year, which was one of my favorite Big Finish stories of last year. Beautiful story. Uh, they're normally very careful with the continuity to have classic doctors not be aware of all of the angels' abilities. For example, it's not until the 11th incarnation that they realize that the image of an angel becomes itself an angel. That's contradicted here. The fourth doctor just knows that that's a thing that the angels can do. They're normally really good with that continuity. Like, it's the nittiest of nitpicks, absolutely. But still, hearing Tom Baker explain quantum locked angels to Margaret, who is just has no idea how to deal with the weeping angels, really great stuff. Let's play a clip. Uh, let's play a clip from Stone Cold. Whatever you do, don't stop looking at it. What? What is it? A weeping angel, a quantum locked organism. It can't move when we're looking at it, but if you look away, even for a split second, even if you blink, it will move terrifyingly fast. And I'm assuming that wouldn't be good. This is only some sort of projection, like a hologram, somehow transmitted from the photograph. I'm guessing it will consume a great deal of energy from the creature to keep it here. I need to blink. Whatever you do, don't, unless we take it in turns. We have to wait it out. Look at the side of it. Tell me everything you see. Well, the robes of its gown, the, the, there's a chunk of stone missing from its side and erosion to the face. It's only got one hand. I may have found the missing one. So what is it? Bad workmanship from whoever carved it? No one carved it. It's injured. And if it's injured, I'm certain it can't maintain this level of power consumption. How certain? Oh, I, I wish I could say very. But that would be a lie. So, my big nitpick about Stone Cold 
is that there isn't really a scene where Leela has a full-blown confrontation with a weeping angel. I think that's just leaving great material on the table, where Leela is like fixated on fighting. You know, a warrior may never turn their back from. You know, that would be really, really cool. You don't get that. Apart from that, though, Stone Cold is a really good base under seed story. I think that the characterization written by, you know, Roland Moore, is able to make the cast feel more than just disposable red shirts to get zapped back in time. I think that the characters are pretty well defined. They've got some great traits uh, that are very memorable. You've got the first class passenger of the of the crashed uh, pleasure cruiser, who is just just the worst and you really, you really hope that the angel zaps them back um it just makes everything very very difficult you've got the person who went out for a mission a reconnaissance mission has now come back feeling a a little bit now worse for wear a little bit uh uh, dazed and confused definitely didn't have a bad encounter with the angel or anything and you've also got the commanders who are way out of their depth like i said this is a pleasure cruiser they were not expecting a base under seed story to befall them i think what's the main mission statement for the angels and demons box set is to throw margaret into the biggest deep ends of time travel possible and what stone cold does is really interesting where the story opens or early on in the story they encounter a grave and then they find the actual person who the grave is named for it's dedicated to on the ship so now it's like fixed in time that that person has to be zapped back to create the grave and also somebody has to go back and make the grave for them it's, it's not an empty grave there's definitely a body in there and it's the morality of i'll try and save you but maybe your fate is what's going to allow everyone else to survive or it's now a fixed event we can't prevent this and margaret who is just a, a, a modern artist a sculptor from ravencliff in her 70s or 80s is just not really equipped for this and the morality of this it's very similar as well it's a great complement to the friendly invasion where you've got these fixed events where she knows that these people these boys are going to go to war and play a pivotal part in the war effort and there'll be tv shows and books dedicated to the band of brothers and she doesn't know how to deal morally with that especially because she did lose somebody in the war as well who she loved and that's at the heart of the angels and demons set where you get these great stories that really test margaret not just the fact that they are like tested in terms of monsters and creatures and ice warriors and weeping angels and weird foxes that are trying to chase a shrunken tardis so you know that's just standard for a companion and it's also stuff that leela is very well adapted towards which is why she's such a great companion to margaret and really great great counter here but Margaret being thrown into all of this and she just doesn't understand it emotionally and logistically, which leads beautifully into Tim Foley's The Ghost of Margaret, where she decides to kind of pack it in. She wants to go home, maybe not forever, but she definitely needs some time after encountering the Weeping Angels. Now, just to sum up on Stone Cold, though, in terms of Weeping Angel stories, they're a great vessel for the story, you know, for sending people back in the morality play, stuff like that. But in terms of actual threats as characters, uh, they're not quite as interesting as they were in like Albie's Angels. They're not quite, uh, there's not the radical deconstruction or reassessing of what the Weeping Angels mean as a monster or as a villain in Village of the Angels for Flux. There's still some cool creepy moments, some great details utilizing their powers that were built upon in the Stephen Moffat era you know uh, the the the, um, the image of an angel becomes an angel being able to possess people angels in your mind stuff there's some good reinforcing of the law there it's a solid weeping angel story but as a effective base under siege they're more a vessel for that and I I, I appreciate a stone call quite a lot it's not like peak weeping angel but it's still an effective big blockbuster chapter and of course having them be the threat on a molten planet where dust is being kicked up and thrown around everywhere and it you know the sound of stone scratching on stone is something that big finish gets a lot of material out of i'll just leave it there but the events of stone cold are distressing enough that margaret decides that she may have had enough for the time being so she's dropped off by the doctor and leela back to ravencliff and the doctor abruptly says goodbye because he doesn't like goodbyes. And then they realize that the place that they left Margaret is not the place where they thought it was. This is kind of Ravencliff, 
but it's also the space in between spaces. It's kind of tough to play a clip or dive into The Ghost of Margaret without actual spoilers. I'll try and tiptoe around it as best as I can. It's only two parts, so it is, once again, like the others, a really brief and breezy listen. Breezy in terms of pace and time. It's not breezy in terms of emotion. There's some very heavy subtext here, where Margaret essentially has been dropped off in a dimension that is able to use her loneliness and her feelings of loss against her and is able to literally consume her from the ground. You've got a really great and creepy performance by Holly Jackson Walters, who plays Alice in this weird lost dimension. Because Alice, years and years ago when Margaret was a child, got lost on a day out with her family, and then a barmaid called Alice rescues her. And now, in order to sort of like, you know, sort of like turn the screw, in order to sort of, you know, stab a little bit deeper, twist the knife into Margaret has taken the form of this person who saved her when she was lost all those years ago. Terrific, creepy villain performance, one of the standouts of the set. So Alice is one of the halfway men, where you've got this weird halfway dimension between reality and anti- Lots of techno babble. Basically, it's an allegory for depression and sadness and loneliness. And Margaret is now stuck in this dimension. All of the experiences from this box set are now sort of pressing down on her. And the loneliness that she's felt later in her life after the loss of the love of her life during the war, all of that stuff is now really becoming physicalized and actualized. And that's the threat of the story. Really heavy stuff. The performances are terrific. Neris Hughes gives her best performance of the series in this story, I believe. I think she's amazing. But also, I know this is Margaret's story primarily. And I won't dive too much into that because spoilers and stuff. But I love what this story does for Tom Baker as the Doctor. There are scenes in this story where I've never heard the fourth Doctor like this. Where he has to confide and ask the TARDIS something in a really beautiful scene. Really, really interesting characterization for the fourth Doctor. And Tom Baker rises to the occasion. He's consistently funny and entertaining over all of these stories. Great quippy dialogue, which I'm sure a lot of it was improvised because that's just the type of guy Tom Baker is. But the fact that he saw the material and what was happening in The Ghost of Margaret in Tim Foley's brilliant script... And he decided, let's take this seriously. I am the Doctor, but I also know that this is subject material that is worthy of taking seriously. And his candor changes, his tone changes. It's really quite outstanding. Including one terrific scene when you really, really sympathise with the TARDIS. Keep in mind that the dimension, if you have feelings of loss or depression or sadness, the ground will swallow you up. Let's play a clip from The Ghost of Margaret. Yes, this is how it was before. Dark and cold and strange. Be careful of your footing. I am always careful of my footing. But the ground here gives way. If you start to feel lost. I do not get lost. I am a hunter, a tracker. You are safe with me and I will lead you to Margaret. We will return to the spot where we made our bridge in the air and follow her from the... That was swift. I had hoped we wouldn't be around to witness this. Doctor! Yes. The TARDIS? Yes. The Earth is eating it! Yes. You do not even try to stop it? No. She's gone. I asked the TARDIS if she was willing to do that for us. And that's why this trip is different, Leela. There is every chance that it'll be one way. The halfway men will feast on her. And, but let's not focus on that now, eh? We must find Margaret. This way. Defrosted Robot 77 beat me to it. 
the TARDIS's Artax from the never-ending story. Yes, it's that scene when it turns out that the, that the horse is actually really depressed and it, and it sinks into the mud. But yeah, Tom Baker really does rise to the material as well. And I'm not saying that classic Doctor Who couldn't get emotional or dramatic. It, it obviously could. But there's something to be said about applying the modern-day interpretation of drama and stakes and heavy subject matter. And having classic Doctors embody that... Tom does a terrific job in this box set. Also, shout out to Louise Jameson. These are four stories, and she isn't the dominant force throughout any of them, but she's consistently great. It's not a thankless performance, because she's, like, so good that it sort of, like, demands respect, and you pay attention to it. Great dialogue consistently and characterization for Leela. She's just a really great, like, anchor for the fourth Doctor, and also for Margaret as well. Really great stuff. Like, even in that scene, like, oh, if you feel lost, the ground will get you. No, I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd ever feel lost. I'm, I'm, I'm a great tracker. It's like, yep, yeah, fair enough. Great stuff. Like I said, the only thing that's kind of missing from this box set is a Weeping Angel and Leela encounter. I think that was kind of it. But the culmination of the ghost of Margaret and the, the decisions that the fourth Doctor has to make the very doctorly solution how they get out of it if they do indeed get out of it you know spoilers and stuff really really imaginative really great stuff i loved it as a box set overall i really really appreciated how it was kind of working to build up margaret as a character while simultaneously deconstructing her emotionally in order to uh, you know in, in order to basically just mess her up um it was yeah and I, I think that tim foley did a fantastic job writing this like this is easily like one of the best scripts that he's done recently he did friend of the family which was the latest diary of river song set which had very similar levels of like emotional maturity and emotional stakes to it so th yeah of course this is very very like tim foley i think i think the man's got some issues i mean that in a good way it comes across incredibly well in his art but yeah so the ghost of margaret is a really really great finale that for some reason you cannot buy as a standalone release despite it unambiguously being the finale to series 12 i i don't know what that decision's all about because oh you know i'll get wizard of time oh i really like this let's listen to stone cold oh it doesn't have the finale i guess i'll have to pay an extra 20 quid even though i already own the first three stories to get the fin big thing rectify that uh, re please please do it add ghost of margaret to stone cold or have it as like a five pound don't download really it does this doesn't make sense i'm sorry this do big finish i love you and thank you for the review copy but this doesn't it doesn't make sense anyway right the interviews are great the stories are consistently strong what with uh, with great emotional heft and emotional complexity brilliant cast all around especially from our three leads uh this is this was really really good there's no story that's like balls out bonkers that's really fun and like leaves your jaw on the floor like the nine there's the, you know uh, there's nothing quite like that you know what was it it was um the dreams of avarice by guy adams you know there's no like bonkers story like that but in terms of just consistently great box set like the four stories really well paced this was such a strong ending to series 12 the beginning of series 12 was you know a bit ho-hum you know fine you know ice heist was fun but angels and demons is like the real deal this is like one of my favorite classic doctor sets from this year so far this was terrific this was recorded several years ago we've got series 13 which was recorded when was this back in 2019 christopher naylor and eleanor crooks are going to be playing harry and naomi respectively anthony howell is playing alan turing in one of these stories we've got the storm of the seas by david k barnes and worlds beyond by robert khan and tom salinsky so yeah this comes out next march series 12 even though 12 series of the fourth doctor shows that big finish have such admiration and respect for this incarnation in particular this era of the show with the fourth doctor and leela and they're still finding interesting and novel things to do with the fourth doctor highly highly recommend series 12 angels and demons as a full release don't get these separately mainly because you don't get the finale what i, I keep harping on that <sighs> don't 